right, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, BQ, the negative BQ. You know how we do. It is the Impact Lounge, number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. I feel like I haven't talked to you guys in quite a while. and I, Well, I guess because I haven't. It's been a couple weeks. Um, I put it out on Twitter. May or may not have seen it, but um, the week that the Multiverse United went down, I was um, I had uh, military duty for about, I don't know, eight days or so. I had four days I had to do here. Uh, and then I took a couple days down in Florida uh, to do some some additional training that I wanted to do with an old supervisor. So it worked out because they didn't really have an episode of impact. It was uh, it was that uh, <laughs> some people got fooled into thinking it was a live episode, and they they were they were choicey with the words. They knew what they were doing, uh, but I think most people knew what it was. Um, but that took place for impact, and then. Uh, they did the Multiverse United, which I didn't really have any interest in because I'm not a, I'm just not a J New Japan fan. There's, there's very few people um, that wrestle over there that I'm gonna like pay my money to see. That's just me personally. I'm not, it's like a, not a knock on them. It's just not for me, you know. So, it kind of worked out. You know, I was out of town, and uh, now we're back up in the place to be. We're gonna talk this episode of Impact. Uh, and before I get into that. I went to the uh, Squared Circle Expo last night. I do this every year. It's in Indianapolis. It's a very big wrestling convention they do. I spend a lot of money there. I'm a real cheap dude. Like I don't like to spend money, but uh, every year if I go to something like this or some some kind of where, you know, uh, I've been to a few after NWA pay-per-views, um, you know, one or two impact ones back in the day. But when I when I can go around, meet wrestlers, take photos, get 8 by 10 signed, you know, like I, I spend some some serious, serious cash. So I uh, went down last night. Um, it's about three and a half hour drive for me. It's, it's not it's not too difficult. Let's see, who did I meet there? I, got, uh, I met Lita, so I'm going to throw that one out there first. I know she's not Impact related, but uh, I met Lita. I did a professional photo op with her, and <laughs> I told her I've been waiting for this day my entire life. So it was really, uh, really cool to meet her. On the Impact side of things, though, I uh, met Kylan King, who... Um, who's actually very beautiful in real life, uh, kind of caught me off guard. Her hair is real badass. Very tall girl. She must be about 6'1". Um, but she was real, real cool. Uh, Macklin, who, oh, man, I, that, that was great. I got to talk with him and Deanna for a while. So I've been really, really um, wanting to meet him. So that was really exciting for me. He was uh, he was very cool. There was a few other Impact people there, Heath and, and Brian Myers. I didn't really have too much interest in. I already met Brian Myers last year. Uh, it was Kind of a dull interaction so i just i just didn't go back to his booth uh this year um cardona was there uh, like i said heath and rhino i, I saw he uh rhino in the bathroom which was kind of funny i almost ran into him uh which that wouldn't have worked well for me if i actually ran into him uh who else from the impact side uh, crazy steve was there so uh met crazy steve and then the hex who's not really impact but they did the impact stuff recently and, and of course i know them so uh that was the first the first couple people I went in, went to go see, and, and I had asked them if they were going to be doing any future Impact stuff, and uh, it seemed like it was up in the air. So it doesn't seem like they have anything, you know, in stone that they're going to do, but they would like to go back. So that kind of answers why uh, they didn't win the titles at one time. It was just a one-off, and it was a very unnecessary one-off, in my opinion, because if you bring them in, like, bring them in to do some shit. Like, you know, as weak as that tag team division is, you know, why not? Um trying to think anyone else impact related i don't think so oh mickey james so i, t I talked with mickey james for a while um, she actually recognized me i hope it's not from this channel uh but i've met her in the past so um that was cool and uh i don't know if you guys get opportunities to do those kind of things like conventions that ever come near you if you can go travel to one like this is one to travel to the one it happens every year april in indianapolis the squared circle expo um it's a lot of fun so um what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about this episode of Impact. First, showing you this can of Starry Soda. By the way, don't forget the Patreon, patreon.com backslash BQ Speaks, and then I'll get into why I'm talking about the Starry Soda. Um, last month, we did all the content free. Uh, this month, uh, in the $1 tier, which is just, just the appreciation tier, the uh, Impact reviews will be on there. Well, you know what? Any content I do this month is going to be in the $1 tier this month. So I might even do it next month too, because then I'm going to have to take a break while we uh, make our move to Las Vegas. 
we got to do in June, pack up the house, all that stuff, and then get out of here by July. So, um, yeah, so probably in the next two months, if you do, if you do the one dollar tier, uh, which is just the appreciation tier, you'll get any of the content that I'm doing, including this episode ad free. Okay, so I wanted I'm, I'm talking about this story because you hear me talk about presentation quite a bit, and every year come January, I'm like, yo, soft rebrand. That's what I call it. I don't even think that's like that's not like an official. Uh, phrase, but I call it a soft rebrand, which is something AEW did to kick out the year. Some, some new colors, new looks, new graphics, you know. And I've been saying this about Impact every year that ch- you got to do something to change a presentation up, even if it's the same, the same shit. And I'm always using the examples of maybe candy bars, boxes of cereal, where they they, they change up the look, but it's the same content inside the box or inside the, the package. But you do it to get people's attention. So if you're not familiar with Starry, Starry was, um, I guess, Pepsi, right? It's a Pepsi product. Sierra Mist was not, uh, I, I get so confused with, with Sprite and, and Sierra Mist and Pepsi and Coke and who's, who's you know, what brands are uh, part of each other. But Sierra Mist was not competing with Sprite. So, I mean, there's still Sierra Mist out there. But if, if you, you know, you're not, you're not aware, they came up with a new formula. A new formulation, I should say, uh, to create Starry because they wanted to get, uh, you know, be more competitive in the clear soda business. Like they were not able to compete with Sprite Seven Up, so they came with Starry. This is essentially the same soda Sierra Mist. I can't say that confidently because if I did a taste test, I'd probably notice a difference. But drinking these, I don't notice the biggest difference in the world. But because it was new and it was different, it's a new can. It's a new name. We buy the shit out of them in my house. My kids drink the hell out of them. I don't even have confirmation that it is different than Sierra Mist. As I said, if I do a taste test, maybe it'll be very obvious. But to me, it kind of tastes the same. But we got on that train. Um, my, my kids got on the train. Like we just, the, the, the little bit of a marketing campaign they did during NBA All-Star Weekend. Like we just got into it. And now we buy um, cases of Starry. And my kids go through them, and um, I have to buy a new case every few days, you know? So the point is, impact and the presentation and the look, like, it's it's just the same graphics, the same everything, every single episode, every single month, every single year. Like, just give, people will get excited if you just change it up a little bit, but it's, uh, they, they are stuck in their formula. And you might be giving them the same product in a different can. So people will get excited about that kind of thing. You know, this particular episode, we got the hard cam where we wanted to be, where we could see the crowd. They didn't have that, that weird filter on it, but the episode was so dark folks. Oh my God. The, um, just the, the, when they mess with the color levels and they edit this show, it's unnecessary. I talk a little bit about, you know, the settings and, and, and saturations and uh, color correction. I, you know, I talk about this all the time. But this particular, uh, there's a setting. It's actually called the levels. But if you if you mess with it too much, it makes the darks dark, like really dark to where they all blend together. Now, black, there's only one shade of black. There's not like light black. And you know, okay, there's only one shade of black. But if if you take depth into into consideration like someone's got a black shirt and then someone 10 feet behind him has a black shirt there's still like contrast they don't blend in together but when you mess with these levels um and and you bring that slider down too much all the blacks start blending in together and that's what this episode was there was a I i tweeted this out bully ray at one point he comes down to the ring he's got a black shirt black jacket black hat uh hat he looks like a head and hands floating in air. Like I tweeted the picture. There's no uh, contrast, no differentiate. You cannot differentiate at all his jacket and the and the background behind him. And even with the fans, like they they look like they're floating heads. It's it's unnecessary. Um, it, it's 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 the signs of someone who's new to what they do. And the more you mess with it, the cooler it looks to you. But it doesn't look good. And Five years from now, these same people are going to look back at these episodes and be like, what was I doing? 
you know, but it was a really, really dark episode. It just continues to look like this. I don't, I, I'll never, I don't think we'll ever understand, you know, it, it, it's, it's wild. It, it just, as far as the episode itself, I thought it was a bit of a bounce back episode. It wasn't a great episode, but it was good. It was solid enough. Uh, you know, the, 2023 has been a bit, a bit of a chore. And I see people say this on Twitter too. So this is not just uh, negative BQ speaking. It's, it's been a bit of a chore this year. It's been difficult to get through. The matches are great, but as soon as the one, two, three happens and they go to something else, it's bad. Nine times out of 10. This, this did have a little bit of that, but I didn't think it was like a horrible episode. I was able to get, get through it and I liked it, you know, didn't love it, but I liked it. So a bit of a bounce back, but I'm still very concerned about episodes going forward. And now they're putting together the matches for Rebellion. And folks, Rebellion is clearly their number four pay-per-view. There's some people, oh, is it hard to kill? Is it Rebellion? It's Rebellion, okay? And Hard to Kill this year, uh, I, I didn't love. And usually that's, I usually like Hard to Kill quite a bit. This particular one I didn't love, but it, but it was good enough. I, I thought there was a couple matches that were so good that it made the pay-per-view good. This they're starting to give us the rebellion card, and I don't think it's very good. I think it's a, a an impact plus card. Now there's a few more matches they got to add, whatever. Um, but when you start doing okay, it's a three way, it's a four way, it's this and this, like it, it becomes like we've seen all these matches already. And the card fe features a couple rematches, which we don't usually get rematches. I've been talking about this for years. We don't typically get rematches on the pay-per-view. They might wrestle in tag team matches or whatever up to it. But but usually Impact does not do that. Like WWE formula where you've seen Cena versus Orin 50 million times and then they wrestle the pay-per-view too. Like Impact's usually pretty good about that. But we're getting a couple rematches this time around. I don't really care for so it almost feels like you've seen the matches already now granted one's gonna be ultimate x but i mean but still uh it still feels like bullet club and motor city machine guns have been wrestling like every single episode i know they haven't but it just it just really feels like that and then obviously there you know we have some i i, I try to get the info from mickey james like are you wrestling at rebellion you know she's like i, I don't know yet um so we have issues with that title and then we obviously have the the world title situation we don't really know what's going to happen is this pay-per-view going to over deliver they typically do they typically do on the on the pay-per-views but bad television is going to lead to bad uh, a bad card not a bad pay-per-view necessarily but bad television bad creative is going to give you a bad card and that's like where we're at right now for rebellion like this is clearly clearly their number four show like hard to kill like let's kick off the year with a bang slam anniversary is always incredible Bound for Glory is hit or miss, but they at least kind of treat it like it like it's important. Rebellion is like. So do you remember? I don't know what if their TV deals with like India and all that shit is the same, but they were required to deliver a monthly pay per view every month, and that's why they did the one night onlys, which the one night only is like nine times out of nine sucked, but they had to had to do it. That's what Rebellion is. Rebellion to me. There was one really good Rebellion show a year or two ago. But Rebellion is like, we need a fourth pay-per-view. So here it is. Here, Here's the here's the pay-per-view. Um, we said we're going to give it to you. Here it is. Like That's how it comes across. And I remember when they were doing the empty arena wrestling, Heart of Kill was still really good. Uh, Rebellion felt like an episode of Impact. I think one year they even did it on Impact. I think they did like a a two night special or something. That's when like Willie Mack won the X division title and everything. So I don't know. I'm, I'm going to try to be optimistic, but I, I don't like where it's going so far. If Steve Macklin doesn't win the world title, like I will give this pay-per-view the biggest thumbs down. You can imagine. I don't think he's going to lose. I don't see why he would lose. He's the only one that speaks English in this feud. Like I, I don't see him losing. But, I mean, Pentagon won the world title at one point, so we'll see. But if he loses, uh, the pay-per-view, no matter what happens up to it, is going to get a huge thumbs down for me, I can assure you. 
All right, so let's get into this episode. Enough, enough talk, right? Uh, Motor City Machine Guns versus TMDK. Uh, you know, I like these guys. I like TMDK. I wasn't really familiar with them, aka I wasn't familiar with them at all. I had no clue who they were. But they they look good. They look like a you know a legitimate tag team. They look like badasses, and I, I enjoy them. So. It just kind of tells me Impact should take a swing sometimes at putting, you know, bringing tag teams up from the indies, even if they're not well known, and, and just see if they can do something and people can get behind them. Because it almost seems like every time they bring up an unknown, they're afraid to do something with them. But I, I would imagine to the majority of the Impact audience, these guys were unknowns as a team, except for the hardcores, obviously. And they've been getting positive reactions. So this is a good way to, um, you know, to kick off the show, but it, it was a good tag team match. And, uh, of course, the Motor City Machine Guns win because they're going to move on to um, uh, Rebellion to, to face the title. So uh, I had no interest in BTI, by the way. It was Champagne Sting and Sierra versus uh, Heath and Rhino. I have no no real interest in that because there's no one, none of them are doing anything right now. So, you know, if you want to watch a match for the sake of a match, watch that. And then... Uh, Chris Bay and, and uh, Ace Austin are backstage. And um, they are talking about challenging, uh, you know, they're, they're, well, they're giving, they're giving the Motor City, Machine, excuse me, Motor City Machine Guns, I guess kind of a hard time, kind of poking fun at them, whatever, which is weird because on, on the other side around, Motor City Machine Guns are always respectful to these guys. But this is why I don't like the Bullet Club, because they wrestle like baby faces. Here they are acting like heels. I, I hate like this the the flip flop dynamic. I've I've always hated that. Excuse me, I'm messing with this power cord real quick. Uh, I've always hated that, and um, I probably always will. <laughs> so, um, you know this this segment was uh, the segment was all right, but they're setting up for rebellion. Uh, looks like they're going to do a ultimate X tag team match. So this is going to be something different. When I first saw the graphic and just saw it was a a rematch. I was like, here we fucking go. Like, I, I just really didn't care at all. Um, but I didn't see the ultimate X portion. So this should be interesting because, you know, they took a chance with the ultimate X knockouts a few years ago. And I think people liked it. I thought it, I thought it got over pretty good and we had some really good performances. So uh, obviously these four could do the ultimate X. Um, but yeah, it, it, this should be one of the show stealers. If it wasn't an ultimate exit match, I wouldn't care because, I, as I said, I just feel like these these guys are fighting each other all the time. And I don't even know that they are. It just feels that way, like I said earlier. Then we got uh, Mike Bailey and Jonathan Gresham 3. Bailey and Gresham. Uh, you know, Tom Hanfin likes to call people by their last names a lot. And I don't know if it's it's like he's trying to do, like, real sports, you know. I, I guess I get it, but... If you're not like Orton or Cena or Lesnar, don't call people by their last names. Because that that's, you know, Austin. Like, that that's – you can call them by their last name, and that's, like, part of their brand. It's kind of like uh, when LeBron's out there. You can call him LeBron. You know, he doesn't go by James. Mickey James doesn't even go by James. You know, but he called – she called James, James. But LeBron – if LeBron doesn't go by James, don't call Mickey James, James. But, you know, like in sports, there's some people you can call by their last name, their first name. And it's like part of their brand. It works. But when it's just like Shelly, Bailey, it, I don't know. Like, it just makes them feel like afterthoughts. I mean, like nobody's like we're just watching Jabron's wrestle. You know, I, there's a lot of wrestling commentators. The majority usually call people by their full name when they're doing the moves. But he likes he likes to do that. And it really stood out to me when uh, Jody Threat was wrestling. <laughs> It's terrorizing. He's just like rising with the reversal and, you know, threat. It just doesn't work. It sounds like really stupid, actually, for for a match like that. You know, if like if Sue Young shows up and he's just like young, it, I don't get it. Anyway, Mike Bailey, Jonathan Gresham three. Uh, this was a really good match, but Stevie Wonder could have seen this through a fucking brick wall that once Trey Miguel came out to commentary. This is going to be at some kind of double disqualification, double count out or, or no contest or something. 
because the winner was going to face Trey at Rebellion for the Exhibition Championship. Like there, I always point out Mike Bailey gets his win back. Like if Mike Bailey loses, Impact is going to get him his win back. Um, so I knew when they had the rematch, like he he, she, he was going to beat Jonathan Gresham. But by the time you do number three, okay, where the fuck's this going? Oh, it's number one contendership for the Exhibition Championship. They're not going to leave one of these guys off the card. I wish they would have the balls to do it, but they're not going to. So uh, even though this was a good match, it's just like we know where this is going, and that's exactly where it went. So very, very safe, very cookie cutter. Um, but we're going to get a three-way. I think what's cool about this, though, because it is a bit of it's a bit rematchy, is that it's going to be a elimination match. Um, I know I'm getting ahead of myself there because they met with Santino later, but it'll be, ex, uh, you know, elimination match. I like elimination matches. If you're going to do multi-person matches, I like elimination. So, but Trey Miguel came, uh, ruined the match. Just very, uh, very TNA. And then um, Sam, fine. Oh my God. Finally, step seven. Feels like fucking step 17. The 17 step process. And I have been saying I'm going to give these guys in this angle a chance, but now I am so bored with it. I am ready for something fun. And what they're doing next is not fun. Ugh. What do you guys think about all this with the design? Um, it's just it's just not enjoyable anymore. I don't like I don't know. I think I always felt like Diener could be a breakout once he was like the, the talker and the main dude, but I, I don't think it's working. I don't think the impact fan likes it very much, but the design is bad. And I was, I was uh, very optimistic about the design when it happened. I didn't like violent by design, but once they like morphed into the design, I'm like, okay, I, I, you know, I like the guys in the group. Let's see what happens, you know? And then there's the backstage segment with um, Santino and Trey and, uh, that's when he's letting him know it's going to be a, a elimination match. I like that Trey Miguel is kind of a competent heel. Like he doesn't really wrestle like a, a cowardly heel. Uh, he's he's just doing very good heel work. It's very very under um, appreciated, I think. And then we get Jody Threat versus Terra Rising. This is Jody Threat's debut. They said, hey, we need someone else with red to um you know, with red hair, preferably to to wrestle for our company. Um, and Jody Threat said, I can do that. And they said, boy, do we have a job for you. Bring your red hair. And here we are. So um, Jody Threat has her match. Her and Tara Rising get the same entrance, of course. Uh, this is one of those things I just feel like you get on the mic and say, making her Impact Wrestling debut instead of just randomly bringing Jody Threat out. For This is for the live audience I'm talking about. Um, but she wrestles Tara Rising. And this is what I was saying earlier, like Hannafin call, you know, Threat, Rising, like – it's a playoff terrorizing, right? Terrorize. So it's rising. But it's not like her last name. And she probably never goes by her last name. You know, terrorize. You just call her terrorizing the, the entire time. But uh, to me, it's annoying. I don't know. But you know me. Like, I, I really nitpick at little things like that. But uh, it's annoying to me. This match was a little long. Uh, kind of should have been a threat. I, I, I thought terrorizing looked a little better, to be honest. Like, I was more interested in, like, in her in this match. Um, you know, we'll see if they bring her back for anything. I, I highly doubt it, but I don't know where Jody Threat fits into the Knockouts roster or Knockouts division right now. Like, I don't see her like feuding with anyone. You know, like it, it just. I thought she looked okay, but I, but I really thought that with having uh, Killer Kelly and having Masha and having Kylan King, like I thought it was a bit redundant you know, like her character and her, her ring work. I thought it was like just redundant to what, what they got. But um, yeah, she's the third red haired wrestler in the knockouts division with killer Kelly and Kylie King. So it's, it's, um, you know, they're obsessed with this color. That's the only color they want you to see. So she fits in perfect, but I, I do think she's like really redundant to what, uh, what they're doing. They're, they're kind of going to like the badass chick thing. Um, I don't know how she fits into this division, though, but it looks like she is around long term. So we'll see. I mean, um, I, I, I just can't. I mean, if you guys disagree with me, cool. I don't see her like cutting promos and feuding with people and stuff like I just I'm, I'm not getting it. 
but I think she has so much similarities to some of the other girls that I it, it just I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I think they're gonna have to like team her up with someone. Then um show Santino. You know, earlier they showed that he was he was taken out, and then Dirty Dango reveals it was the design. So he knew. I don't know if he saw it and didn't save him or what. You know, I actually thought this was funny when uh, he called himself like, you know, I'm just not doing a good job as the assistant dictator of authority. And the way Scott Demore just continued looking forward at Santino and barely even acknowledged him and said, it's actually director of authority and you've never been assigned that position. I thought I like dry humor. I thought that was like really funny. Uh, so that came out cool, but they are doing the design. So step seven of the 23 step process was to take out authority or something like that. So he attacks Santino. So Santino is in a match at Rebellion. This is what I'm saying. Like, this is not their, you look at, you know, Dreamer and, and, and <laughs> God, Dreamer and Bully Ray. Like, this is their number four show, folks. We're going to get Dirty Dango, Santino, and Joe Hendry versus The Design. You could probably count on two hands how many people want to watch that match. So this just seems so underwhelming for where they're going with the design. Like, okay, is we're thinking, oh, Sammy's going to bring OVE back or something, which is entirely still possible. But uh, they're up to the pay-per-view, and it's wrestling Dango and Santino. We'll see. Um, I think they think this is going to get clicks and, and and everything on social media. You know, oh, every Santino clip does well, so we're going to put him in the ring. You know, like, I, I, I people don't, they're not a fan of Santino because they want to see him wrestle. You know, like, they're a fan of the comedy, and, and what, but his matches do not draw money. So we'll see what they do. Uh, me and Gio is backstage. All these backstage segments, really good lighting. They looked really good this episode. And I keep, I've been saying this lately. There's no substitute for good lighting. Um, oh, I, I wanted to say, you know, I'm always, oh, the pink lights, the purple lights. So you know what I noticed that every company does this? Uh, I noticed it on Ring of Honor. I was watching Ring of Honor. They use like a red one. But it's very subtle in the background. And then I was watching some NXT clips. They were backstage in a locker room and they had these lights and then i was watching this old rick flair and carlito backstage thing just came across it on youtube a few days ago and they got lights blue like blue lights the thing is the the lights are within the color scheme they're not just like random ones that don't go together like what impact does but they're also very subtle and the 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 rest of the lighting is so good that it's just a bit of an accent to where impact is like they're in the dark but then they have the, <clears throat> excuse me, the purple lights as like, a, uh, you know, the, the main color source almost. And I, so now I'm like, yo, I see what they're trying to do. And actually, um, imp uh, excuse me, AEW will do like backstage, oh, not backstage, but um, like vignettes of someone talking. And, but I'm talking about like real quick vignettes, like they're, they're building up a match and two people are going back and forth. And I noticed they'll have the light in the background. Kind of like they did for Steve Macklin when he used to do his. You know, he had like a green one in the background. Deanna did one recently with a blue light. Like, there's a way to accent it and make it make it look cool. But the way they do it, where like it looks like they're just randomly setting them throughout the arena, looks bad. So there's no um, substitute for good lighting. So these backstage segments looked really good. The Gia interviews, they go back to messing with the levels, and they're really dark. Um, I'm looking at a screenshot right now. The Impact uh, screensaver on the TV is completely blended into the background to where it looks like the word Impact is floating in the air. Um, I don't know. But anyway, she interviews Tasha Steeles, and Tasha Steeles is now a baby face. She needed something different. The fans like Tasha Steeles, you know, so I, I think this was a good way to freshen up her character. And then, um, Savannah, excuse me, Savannah Giselle and David Alcom. I, I would like to see Tasha Steeles and Giselle at the pay-per-view, even if it's the pre-show, but it's 
hey, let's get it next week. You know, um, I'd rather she wrestles Savannah next week and then build build to something with Giselle. But it's like we just get these matches so quickly. It's it's insane. I know they have to put on some kind of match on the show. Like, don't get me wrong. We can't. Someone has to wrestle. But even if you just make us wait like two weeks, <laughs> you know, like I just think. You know, we just want to see some kind of like progression. You know, we joke about it's the bump into someone backstage and then you have a match. So, but uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how this um, Tasha thing goes. She's she's done so much like improvement in her time with the company. Uh, she's, you know, becoming a real, real star in her own right. Then we get Bully Ray in the good hands versus Tommy Dreamer, Yuya Jabamura, and Darren McCarty. I hate matches with athletes celebrities who come in and beat trained professional wrestlers this screamed wwe this was the worst part of the show the match itself was not actually that bad but we're getting bully ray versus tommy dreamer in hardcore war when they had their match at no surrender or sacrifice whatever the hell it was i said okay cool no we no one wants this but at least it's on the impact plus show and then it's going to be over. And then someone's going to move on and do something else. How foolish of me. Because now we're getting a rematch. There's three rematches in this card so far. And you could even call it, it's really four, technically. Because right now we're getting Deanna and uh, uh, Jordan Grace, too. So technically, we got like four rematches on this thing right now. Um, but the match, as again, it, it was fine, but we're just, we're continuing to get this. Like, no one really wants it. Um, I mean, the the Tommy Dreamer Bully Ray stuff is getting views on YouTube. But not every view is created equal. Just because something, like, let's just say there's a viral video come goes out and it has 3 million views. Like, oh, people must really want to see this. No, like a lot of those people just want to see a car crash. It's the lower view, not the lower viewed stuff, but the stuff in the middle. That's like what is a better representation of what your fan base wants to see. So just because he's like got views, I don't think people really want to see it. You know, there, there's just there's an audience out there. It's like, oh, what's Bully Ray doing? You know, but it, no one's going to buy the pay-per-view for this match. So after the match, this was by far the worst part of the episode. Um, you know, uh, I don't even know. Oh, so McCarty hits a stunner, the Stone Cold stunner on Skyler to get the win. It looked it actually looked pretty good, but athlete comes in, pins a trained professional wrestler. They've done the good hands, no no favors. And then Kenny King runs down. And, you know, earlier there was a segment where, where Eddie Edwards was asking Kenny King, he said something like that. And Kenny's like, no, nah, I don't got your back. Uh, you, you didn't have my back. And this worried me because Kenny, I thought, was, you know, he's got all the charisma that Eddie Edwards lacks. And I thought uh, Eddie needed him. Clearly, that's not the case. You know, Kenny is saying, I'm going to do something. Um, something big tonight. And by the way, when Eddie was talking to Kenny, I thought he was talking to the kendo stick. I wasn't even looking at the screen. I just like, Kenny. And uh, Eddie said like seven words in the whole segment, and three of them were Kenny. Kenny. So uh, Kenny King runs down. And then immediately, Killer Kelly runs down. I'm sorry, not Killer Kelly, Frankie Kazarian. Immediately. And then Masha runs down and then Killer Kelly. And there is like a separation of like three seconds between these run-ins. And, and wrestling is good. I sound like Bret Hart now. Re wrestling is good when we're supposed to believe it's real. They have to act like it's real. That's when it comes off good on TV. Like we know it's not real, but you have to present it like it's real. So say Kenny King ran down. Awesome. He was planning to do something big. Frankie Kazarian, three seconds later, were they hanging out together backstage in Gorilla? Yeah, yeah, they were. We know that they were. And then, randomly, a girl runs out, and it's Masha, and Killer Kelly is, is two seconds behind her. This screamed WWE. 
Um, so now we know the hardcore war teams. I know who Tommy Dreamer's fifth member is, by the way. I don't think it's come out on social media. Um, it is as underwhelming as you can possibly be. When they're almost teasing, like, who's going to be the fifth guy? You think maybe it's going to be Scott. Like, he's going he's gonna to come wrestle. We don't want to see that. But it's 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 super underwhelming. Um, so I don't know. So we're we're gonna get um, so one team will be Tommy Dreamer, Frankie Kazarian, Jabba Mura, uh, Killer Kelly, and then the the first the fifth person who it, it's not exciting. Trust me. And then they're gonna be taking on the Good Hands, Bully Ray, Kenny King, and Masha Slamovich. So I I think. In, um, including the women in this is going to save it a little bit because we like both of them and we especially like to see, uh, you know, Killer Kelly out there. So I just, uh, I just want Killer Kelly to do good things. I really, I really like her. I don't want her to be a part of, part of bad, bad segments. Then Eddie Edwards versus PCO. Speaking of things I don't want to see. So it is safe to assume that these guys are going to wrestle again in Rebellion. I think it's going to have to do with a, a shovel and being in the desert. Well, I guess they're in Canada, so I don't know if there's many deserts out there. Some sort of buried alive shit. I'm, I'm going on a limb and saying that's what they're building to. But if these two wrestle at the pay-per-view, which we're expecting, this is five rematches or five matches we have already seen. They may have, have some stipulations or some fuckery, but their matches we have already seen. And Eddie, um, you know, Eddie comes out. I say this every week. He looks ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> who was that that turned heel? I was at, so I went to uh, AEW two weeks ago. It was in St. Louis. So I was there for the Brian Danielson heel turn. And I mean, the place went crazy. If you watch that clip, uh, the place really went crazy. But it was delivered in a way where it's like, <clears throat> excuse me, woo. it was delivered in a way of like, what's Brian Danielson going to say next week? His promo was bad, by the way. But you still were like, what's he going to do? And I, you have some intrigue, like what's heel Brian, Brian Danielson going to do from week to week? And that's what I thought it was going to be with Eddie. And I really think someone has to take him under their wing and be like, hey, this is what it takes to be a heel. Like, you know, he has he has dimples, he has green hair, you know, he can't control the dimples, obviously, but um, you, you just got to look at what he has, what he's working with, say, yo, let's, how can we change this presentation up? You know, it's probably why he has the beard to, cover, you know, try to cover the dimples, whatever. Um, but he, him as a heel is bad. It's, it's not fun. Maybe some of you guys like it. I'm not. I'm, I'm not really enjoying it. And and as I've said, I don't care about this feud. But but I thought that the match was okay because I've been coming around on PCO and starting to like really understand the gimmick. And I'm like, all right, cool. You know, this is actually he's really committed to this. You know, it's reminiscent of early Undertaker days where you couldn't really hurt him. Like you could get him off his feet and he might be down for a couple of seconds, but he's gonna get back up. Uh, and I always liked wrestlers like that. There was there was a few wrestlers like that actually, not just the Undertaker. Uh, back in the early 90s, late 80s, that could take quite a bit of punishment. Um, but they didn't stay. Like, the like Riss is random as shit, but like the Berserker. He would wrestle, and but he didn't feel a whole lot of pain. He lost matches, but he, you know, he could stay down for a period of time to beat him, but you couldn't, like, take him off his feet, and he's going to stay down for 10 seconds, you know? <laughs> so I kind of appreciate that about PCO. It's kind of, it's kind of old school, and it works. Um, but Eddie wins this thing with the, uh, the Boston knee party. Alicia comes out and they, they made it clear before this, that Kenny was not going to help her and that he was not the one driving the car. So we assumed Alicia was driving the car. Looks like she was, she came out, um, and she's finally doing a much needed heel turn. She's wearing green also. So this is, um, at least it's not red, but she comes out and she's, uh, you know, she hits PCO with the kendo stick has the heel turn face and um i'm interested in this like eddie heel i'm not alicia heel i am because it's so different and it's probably the biggest role that they have given her in a while so i'm very curious to see 
how she does and if it improves the Eddie Edwards heel character. I'm a little worried about their dynamic because usually when they're backstage and they're talking, it's it's community theater. So uh, I'm a little like they're not believable. Either of them are believable. That's that's what the problem is. And that's why I don't think the, the heel anything is working. Like he's playing a character and we know he is. Um, we're not buying it, you know. So make, making, making both of them heels this could be interesting. Could be interesting. I'm curious to tune in next week, though, and see see what happens. Like people talk a lot about Alicia's mic skills. But I think people are more comfortable when they're heels. So, you know, maybe she's going to maybe she's like going to take this and run with it and be one of the best part best parts of the show. Who knows? You know, the optimism, I, the optimism that I had for Eddie as a heel and it didn't really work out. Like maybe she maybe she's a star. Maybe she's a standout from this. You know, we'll see. So. Um, it's gonna be interesting, and the the episode did did better viewership wise than it has, which is good because you know it was it was it was a solid episode. So um, we'll see. Um, and then Josh Alexander, oh, they run down next week's card. I'm sorry, and it's um, you know, it's, it's we own the night for five minutes. Um, but we're getting the final decision on Mickey James, so. <laughs> it's funny because I, you know what I asked her last night, are you wrestling? And she said she's, she kept the kayfabe because she was like, I, ju I just realized this right now. She kayfabe me, but um, she said she's waiting to get cleared. So <laughs> I guess we'll find out next week. Um, I'm sure she's wrestling. And then we're getting uh, Giselle versus Tasha. As I said, I would have rather got Tasha versus um, uh, Savannah Evans here. And then build to something with these other two because what what are the, what else are they going to do at Rebellion if they're if they're going to have a match? I mean, they're both at pre-show level right now. Are they going to wrestle again on the pre-show? You know. And then we're getting Callahan and Angels versus Hendry and Dango. So this match that already is not interesting, you're giving us um, this right? Is my math right? Sixty sixty six point six. Repeating, of course, percent of the match. It's like a 67 percent of the match. They're, they're, they're involved in this now, and we're gonna get the fucking match. So now at Rebellion, it's pretty much gonna be another rematch because now you're putting Santino in, who's not gonna wrestle much, and then Diener being the leader, violent by design or by design, I should say, he's not gonna wrestle a lot either in that match. So you're pretty much giving it away now, and whoever loses here is gonna win at Rebellion. And then we get Kenny King versus Frankie Kazarian. They didn't officially announce the, the hardcore war teams. And this is the the problem with the with one of the little problems with the creative and the, the presentation of the show is that when there's any kind of mystery, oh, who's this gonna be? Who's this partner gonna be? Like it's so overwhelming the way they deliver it. They did not make it clear these were the teams. We just assumed as viewers. But now we're gonna get this match, which is gonna be the best match of the show, I assure you. Kenny King versus Kazarian. The heels typically win these because the winner is going to have the advantage for Hardcore War. Usually the heel wins. That's probably what's going to happen. And Kenny King needs a win, so we'll see. And then at the end, Josh Alexander comes out. He relinquishes the world title. Lots of talking with him and Scott, and I, I, I don't really care for, for Scott on the mic. I don't care for Josh on the mic a whole lot. I thought it, it really dragged, but... Um, I didn't buy the emotion. I, I would have like his wife was really emotional. I think she did a great job. Like Josh kind of came out with like boo boo face, but it didn't look like it was it was real because I think he'd already known for a while he was gonna you know drop the title. The kid even did a good job. His son did a good job, but he kind of you know Josh kind of came out boo boo face. Like it didn't really look like he was that sad. I'm sure he really is. I'm just saying it didn't look like it. Uh, but this went on for a while, and then then Macklin comes in and saves it. And that's what I have been saying. He was going to save this feud from from being boring because I, I just think he's great. And when he was pointing out, like, yeah, okay, I tapped out to the hoverboard lock because I'm not going to sit in the lock like an, like you, like an idiot. I meant to bring that up to him when I met him last night that I, I really thought that was um, a really underrated part of the segment. You know, I'm not going to stay in a – the the hover hoverboard lock like like an idiot like you um but but everything macklin said here 
was good. And they're they're trying to hype up this match that is a you know an impact plus mid card match as the main event. It's likely not going to main event event the show. I would I would be shocked if it wasn't anything other than the, the knockouts. I, I actually am like positive it's going to be the knockouts. Um, but I'm still really looking forward to this because it's time for Madden to get his due and to get his his title. But um, I just thought he saved the the whole segment from just really dragging on and just going and going and going. Um, you know, I I don't know if the fans were buying it as a sympathetic baby face thing, but you know, it's it's whatever. Uh, and most likely Macklin's going to win this thing, have the title forever, and then they're going to really do this match down the road because Impact doesn't deviate. I don't know that any company deviates. When they say, hey, this is where we're going, well, WWE probably deviates. They change things last minute all the time. But the other companies are like, hey, this person, this match is going to happen, or this person is going to be the champion, or this person is going to lose. Like, it's going to happen. You know, so that's why I'm very positive that Macklin's going to win and hold it until he has to ultimately wrestle Josh. And I think he'll beat Josh too, because he's probably supposed to beat him at Rebellion, so he's going to beat him when they fight then too. That's just uh, the way that I see it. So that'll do it for me, folks. Talking about Impact, again, you can head over to patreon.com backslash Speaks, join the $1 tier, which is typically the support tier, and you can check this uh, podcast out ad-free. And any, any uh, now that I'm back in town, uh, going to work on some other content uh, during the week here, and that will continue to go up on the Patreon. So uh, the YouTube is going to be pretty much just uh, the Impact Review, and then maybe when I do a Moving the Needle podcast and, and things like that, there's going to be uh, you know additional things here on the channel. But for the most part, all my opinions, um, uh, I need to research a little bit. I guess Impact booked the 10,000 seat arena for their next show. Um, I'm going to look into that and my opinion will be on, on the Patreon, not, not here on the YouTube. So uh, that'll do it for me. I'm your boy BQ and I am out. Peace.